the most natural human response when someone you love is struggling is to try and scoop them up and fix whatever it is that's causing them pain and make it all go away. And often, while that makes us feel good because it eases our discomfort that we can't fix this, it can be almost disempowering for the person who's going through their own process and their own journey. And um, that doesn't mean don't support them but support is best when it enables kind of a recovery so let's say someone's really struggling and it part of their therapy is to make sure they get out for a walk every day but they're still managing to cook right they're still managing to make themselves meals every day if you, if someone then goes into that environment and says don't worry about the cooking i'll cook for you i'll bring your meals around da, da, da. you've taken that thing from them that feels like you're doing a nice thing but essentially that was something they were managing and then once that's taken away from them, they then have to think about putting that back in place. It becomes another rung of the ladder to work on. Whereas... Julie, how are we doing? I'm really good, thanks. I'm, I'm excited to have a chat, actually. Thanks for having me on. No, not at all. Very excited to have you here. And you are 18 weeks, number one Sunday Times bestseller list at this point, are you? I think so. Yeah, I think so. Something like that. <laughs> congratulations first of Thank all i think it, it's fair to say but it's uh it's an incredible book i must say i think the, the practical application of it is something that's been missing from the market and i think that's where the real value is as i'm sure you've been told by, by several others but first of all why don't we actually assess your clinical psychologist what does that actually entail yeah. and how did you get there yeah i mean um that's a common question actually you know what's the difference between a, a clinical psychologist and psychiatrist and that kind of thing and um it, it, this path to a clinical psychologist is you you study psychology you say so you do like an undergrad degree and then you often work in sort of mental health or brain injury for a few years and get that sort of clinical experience and then you apply to do a doctorate in clinical psychology so that's another three years and then um what you end up doing is it, you can either go into sort of brain injury work or or you can work in mental health and so you're offering psychological therapies so talking therapies and assessments as opposed to maybe a psychiatrist who would study medicine and then move into mental health from there. So their main role is is generally within medication and that kind of thing. Fantastic. What was your uh, what was your doctorate in? I'm sure it was a very uh, non-exciting title as they tend to be, but if you don't mind me asking. Uh, yeah, well, well the, the doctorate is a sort of clinical psychology doctorate, but I guess from there you can kind of specialise, you know, so I my, my research was in... Um, a sort of post-traumatic growth responses after breast cancer um, and then sort of in my final year so my clinical work specialized in uh, military uh, work so I worked on a, a specialist ward that was for MOD staff um, so lots of sort of trauma stuff and things like that which is a big deep dive what you know a big uh, sort of diving into the deep end uh, sort of initially qualifying but really good experience for me in the long run. And, and these conversations, these people you've worked with, the trauma that you've unpacked is ultimately why the book is called what it is, isn't it? Because you've got the question, why has nobody told me this before so many times from the people you're working with? Yeah, essentially, I, you know, once I left the, I left the NHS once I had a couple of small children and, you know, couldn't sort of do it all, not well anyway. So I decided I would just run a really small private practice from home. Um, so I was just seeing one person at a time, you know, um, and sort of in school hours and that kind of thing. And, and I noticed at that point, lots of people were coming along and, you know, people don't realize that a, an aspect of, of therapy is educational. So you learn a bit about how your brain works and how your mind works and how you can influence your emotional state and your mood. And lots of people, once they had that education, they were raring to go. They, they were saying things like, why has nobody told me this before? This is not rocket science. But when I put it into my life every day, it makes a difference. Um, and so those people found that quite empowering. So yeah, I wanted to make that more available. And that's really why I started putting things on social media I was, you know, my husband said, well, you know, go on there, make it available. And, um, and so we, yeah, we started to make a few terrible YouTube videos and stuff. And, um, yeah, two years later, here we are. I think it's, uh, in a, in a very positive way, it spiraled out of control somewhat, hasn't it? Yeah, it, at times it felt like a rocket was taking off and I was just grabbing on for dear life and trying to do the right thing at the right time. And um, and I think timing timing was a big part of it, you know, that um, short form video became this huge way to, um, to access, you know, big numbers of people across the world and... And so we started at that right time, but also, you know, the pandemic and, and people in lockdown. So not only were they spending more time on their phones, but 
they were also because you know the, the account isn't about me it's about sharing information so the fact that people were clicking follow on an account that was about mental health education said a lot about what we were all dealing with at the time and you know the sorts of information people were looking for I think. And how did you deal with it at the time because I can imagine the perspective shift from running a private practice to feeling duty bound to continue sharing this information online you at one point you were having 100 150,000 followers a month a week was it it was it, either way it was stratospheric yeah. a yeah. lot of people fast so how how did your perspective on your place in the world your family and the direction you want to go in change when when things were really started to go rocket ship mode yeah do you know it didn't always feel um it was a positive thing, but it didn't always feel positive because it was really, really hard work. You know, I was doing lots of video because we saw this huge opportunity, you know, that the more you were putting on, the more it was growing and it felt like it could end at any point. So we were working on it as if it was going to end next month. You know, we were saying, let's give it everything because then it's going to drop off a cliff at some point and it's just going to, you know, it's um, the, the followers will stop coming and it will it will end. So let's have this impact while we can. And um and so we were working really, really hard and then it just kept going. And then at some point along the way, I was tired and I was concerned that it was taking me away from the children and the whole idea of having a really small private practice was that I could manage that around the kids and be the parent I want to be and all that kind of thing. So for me, it made me sort of stop and question and reevaluate, um, okay, why am I doing this? And what's the sort of the main aim? and how much of my life do I want it to take up and that kind of thing. And I don't think I've got that perfect, but we're certainly a bit more balanced now where um, we're able to kind of say yes to the stuff that we really want to do and that we feel could have a really good impact and um, and say no to the other stuff, I think. <clears throat> and ultimately, I think, it's, I think it's fair to say that your social media and your approach to it is very much trying to equip others with the toolkits that you've learned from a clinical point of view. And that's obviously the thread of DNA that runs through the book and is a testament to you and the team. It is so, so clear and easy to apply in terms of placing it within the context of your own life. And I think that's what, what the book does best from, from my perspective. So those, those toolkits that you, you speak about and try and equip people with through social media and in the book itself, what are the, what are the universal ones? What are the ones that you think are most applicable to those of us in the Western world that have just got that day-to-day -day mental health management that we need to work on a little bit more? Um, I would say, you know, starting from that center point of recognizing that you you do not have to be at the mercy of your emotional state, that there are things you can do to influence and bring down the intensity of painful emotion. And 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 a lot of people, I think, maybe come along to therapy and, and that feels like news. That feel what? You know, I, I get to, you know, do things to um, impact on on how I feel that's that's a really big deal and um, because you you then don't feel that you're in the hands of whatever doctor or therapist you see either this is your journey and you're working on it and um, that there are these tools that can help and it doesn't mean to say that you will have a problem-free life and you will never feel painful emotion again it's that when life throws its terrible stuff at you as it does every now and then you've got something to to work on it with so you know for um for me um you know one of the sort of really helpful things about an approach like cbt for example is just this basic idea that um there is no on and off switch for emotions right that would be really great if we could wake up and decide today i want to feel love and excitement and then it would just happen we don't we can't do that but how we feel is so heavily influenced by what we do what we don't do whether we act on urges or not uh the the thoughts that we give our time and attention to and buy into um or whether we you know turn our attention to other things how we talk to ourselves in our heads all of those thought processes uh and how we treat our bodies and and those sort of physical sensations so um we can use those three other things so you know what you, you your behavior your thoughts and your physical state you can use those three to influence how you feel because the three are so the four of them are so closely entwined they're like they're like weaves in a basket and you don't if you're not self-aware you you don't really experience them as the weaves you experience the basket as a whole right you just have this experience that feels overwhelming 
And often the process in therapy is about pulling some of those weaves out and going, right, this was the experience, but what what was going through your head at the time? Or what was the thought process? Or what were you believing? And um, how much were you believing in the thoughts that arrived? And, um, you know, what were you doing? Or what was the urge to do? And did you follow that urge? Or did you go against it? And how did that impact on how you feel? And you start to see this pattern of how these weaves fit together to make that experience. And then you can start to look at, okay, well, here's the exit to this vicious cycle. When I do this, things feel different. And when I do that, I feel more stuck. And it just opens, not in a self-critical way, but in a curious way that it all becomes a bit of an experiment. You know, I know that when I do this, I have a better day. And I know when I do that, um, things get worse. You know, I feel, maybe I feel good in the in the short term, but I feel worse in the long term and those kind of things. So um, it becomes this process of sort of learning about yourself and how you work that can just keep going. And it's, I think there isn't this kind of like one skill that makes everything okay. It's that that process of constantly learning about yourself and what works and, and the commitment to keep going on that journey, I think. 100%. And you, you mentioned the fact that people felt very empowered by the sessions that you had with them during your doctorate and, and beyond, I assume. And I almost view it as a, a bit of a democratization of mental health in terms of ownership, self-awareness, and helping people understand things under their own roof before looking for necessary alternatives, perhaps. Because what's your view on on your role in these people's lives? For those of, For those people that come to you for therapy, do you view yourself as the person that provides the solutions or do you view yourself as a catalyst for their own understanding where do you where do you draw that distinction yeah catalyst is a great word it, um there's almost this kind of i have this sort of vision as you were saying it then as you know people as they come through the therapy door of me i mean i don't sort of grab the hand but almost this idea of me kind of linking arms with them and then walking through this journey with them and there's something about just being with that person and being so committed to understanding in such detail what that experience is um, and being that person that 100% has that person's back. That I mean, there's this distinction um, that often made between kind of sympathy and empathy. That sympathy is if someone's in a big hole, you kind of stand on the edge and you look down and you go, oh, that looks awful. Good luck. And, and empathy is you grab a ladder, you climb down and you go, yeah, this is really rough. How are we going to get out together? And and that really for me is a great vision of kind of what therapy is. Um, you have to be willing to get in there with someone and 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 work through that together. So, um, but yeah, the, the minute you try and tell someone what to do, they are instantly less likely to do it. Um, so it's a process So you know, we talk about there's a technique called kind of guided discovery where um, you you just ask the right questions and you kind of prompt and you shift and you change direction in that conversation so that that person can uh, be guided towards their own solutions for something. And when someone discovers that for themselves and comes to their own decisions about change, it is much more likely to happen and much more likely to be sustained. Um, then if someone comes in the room and I go, well, here's what I would do, you know, good luck with that. You know, it just doesn't, just doesn't work. Which is why broad brush stroke solutions that we can often see in social media that aren't quite as effective as yours aren't necessarily the ones that are going to have a, a more tangible impact on, on the crisis that we're in nationwide. I think it's probably fair to say. Yeah, and I think there's a sort of general gist, isn't there, where people are looking for the... Uh, what is it like the silver bullet or the one thing that's going to make everything better and and often it's a process of sowing seeds because it's part of life that you've got to discover your own you know what works for you and what your meaning is and your sense of purpose and what's going on in your relationships and so there isn't one thing that works for everybody because everyone's living a different life and um so yeah I think a lot of my videos and stuff like that are about sowing seeds and ideas that might just shine a light on something for somebody so I, I had therapy for the first time in September or October 2018, it would have been. And that was after years of being a very, very masculine, resilient to the idea bloke, the usual. There's lots of us out there. Less than there were years ago, though, I'm, I'm hopeful of. But for me, I very much viewed it as I was guided through that process. I had that, that arm linked and, and I could understand the situation that I was in and who I was as a person much better, which then equipped me with the self-awareness and understanding what not to do, what to do moving forwards. And that was, that didn't take long. 
And obviously, I'm not saying that oh, go to two therapy sessions and everything's gonna be solved for solved for everyone everywhere. But for me, that self awareness that was unlocked through that process is something that I would recommend to everyone, male, female, wherever we sit. And I think there are cost prohibitive elements. I don't want to say oh everybody should get therapy because that would be that would be ignorance of the reality of the situation. But I think where your social media was so eye catching for me is it is it gives that process, it gives that first baby step, it gives that seed to be planted so that people can start to think about things a little bit differently. The longer you do that and the more you open yourself up to it, the more that you can actually understand, oh, that made me feel this way. Yeah. Don't do that. Or do more of that. Or interact with that person in a different way. These sort of things. And from my personal point of view, my definition of masculinity, my definition of success and the direction I was going was completely reworked by I think it was six or seven sessions in total. So just on that, how would you summarize your perspective on the disparity between masculine perception of mental health and f- more feminine perception of mental health in terms of the the ultimate statistics that men are more susceptible to keeping these things quiet, more susceptible to the act of the act of suicide, and something that's obviously very personal to me from that point of view, but I have the understanding from a personal perspective, but it'd be very interesting to hear a clinical overview of the things that you've picked up on. Yeah, I mean, it's it's fascinating isn't it? because of the kind of experiences that I've had, you know, um, even sort of before I qualified when I was specialising and I was doing all the stuff with uh, the MOD and, and working with soldiers and stuff. And um, there were certain approaches that seemed to um, uh, sort of lend themselves more to, to that sort of audience, if you like, you know, um, certainly there was a for for i say i don't want to say all men but those those men in particular they they liked to have a clear idea of like what's the homework what do i need to do and and this will make it better and stuff um to have a sort of clear concrete plan those kind of things are very practical and stuff but um then you know later you know that there was that experience but then later on even doing this stuff um 75 percent of my audience are female so and i don't i don't have the crystal ball or the data to suggest that that is for um any particular reason that that you know it might be that that that's because you know it fits with the stats that men don't like to talk about these kind of things but also maybe they're following someone else maybe maybe men prefer to hear that information from a man and that would be fine you know um you've only got to look at the following of someone like jordan peterson for example and um that the, it's mostly men that follow him he's a clinical psychologist so um there could be that there could be that that um that those things influence it so yeah i don't think i have the sort of full answer really i think um i think things are shifting i think historically there has been this this sense of masculinity involves um not engaging with emotion and not um acknowledging it let alone working on any of it um and yet in this sort of new era where you have access to education around this stuff and people are talking more and more openly about it um you know i've come across these incredible people that have approached me along the way um a a good friend of mine uh, called Joe, who who was in special forces, and um, through his own experience, um, has now you know devoted his career to creating um, sort of uh, opportunities for for people to access therapy online um, in a way that is branded towards men and and those um, masculine men from you know his type of background from the special forces where they were probably put off by all the pastel colors and the um the idea that it's a very feminine thing so i yeah i mean i don't know i think i think we're in a, a time where massive change is happening you know there are brave people like yourself who are swimming against the tide and and saying do you know what this is something that's okay to talk about you can be a really masculine strong guy um who other people can look up to and you can also be strong enough to to tackle you know mental health issues as well as physical health issues and that the two should be no different and you can't be the strongest man you want to be without looking at both of those and making sure they're both um you know tip top so i think you know people like you are making that massive difference for men that probably people like me can't do so much um because you can be that role model 
I, I, the role models is funnily enough the thing that I reference most when I when I reflect on probably the earlier stages of when I started to go downhill is that I felt very very isolated and unique for feeling the way that I did because I couldn't identify with any men that I felt I looked up to that were open and honest about this sort of thing so I think from a personal point of view that's something I try and put across but more importantly people like Joe the special forces are pretty hard blokes I think it's fair to say yeah so them talking about this is very much bringing down that entry point for people so that there's more role models out there and and like we were speaking about offline before you can't really use the straw man argument of oh well talking about mental health makes you weak when you've got special forces blokes when you've got England rugby captains when you've got this when you've got that people talking about it it does bring that gap closer and closer and I do think the tide is turning which is fantastic it's just interesting to hear uh, your perspective having worked in the space in a professional and then a an online international point of view so from a overarching point of view the book has obviously leveled things up social media has given you the reach that you never could have had in terms of if if it didn't exist years before and that stratospheric growth has led to the book and that has landed so so well what has the process been for you as an individual in terms of unpacking the experience of writing the book and then having conversations along the way of attending events hearing from people that the book has impacted what's the experience been like i can imagine amidst the chaos there's been some real real rewards but i can imagine there's also been some significant challenges uh, yeah i mean the whole process has been for me <laughs> one of practicing what i preach so i'm saying all this stuff online about don't make your life decisions based on fear make them based on your values and stuff and then i'm kind of thinking you know um you know i sat down i remember that first day where i sat down to start writing the book and you know i had to churn out 3000 words a week to to meet the deadline and and we were homeschooling and it was just Um, And I remember thinking, how? Like, I know the psychology, but if I'm going to write a book, I mean, I'm a big book person. (laughs) This is like a tenth of my book story, you know. um, We've got bookshelves all around the place because I'm a a real bookie. And um, so I have a real respect for decent writing and stuff. And and so that led to this sort of huge, oh, gosh, what have I what have I got myself into here? Um, I know the psychology, but can I can I write it in a way that I'm proud of? And so I started, when I should have been researching, I was I was buying books left, right and center about how to write, <laughs> how to write well. And, uh, you know, it got, you know, a couple weeks in, I'm like, I have to start <laughs> Productiv- writing. Productivity hacks, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I really need to actually just put some words down now. And so even that, you know, the roller coaster of um, having to, deal with your own self-doubt every day and then get over that hump and start moving and doing the thing um so that you had something to improve you know kind of being willing to be rubbish at it for a while and create that terrible first draft and stuff like that um it all helped you know it was at the time it felt kind of hellish you know I started to for the first time in my life I wasn't sleeping well because I would wake up in the night and think of some thing that I'd written or how I wanted to write the next bit and then of course you can't sleep because you're thinking about doing that and um yeah, that was probably the only time in my life where I didn't sleep that well was when I was writing and it was probably full of self-doubt. I think that's probably what it was. Um, but then, you know, and also my main aim, I remember having this conversation with my husband, our main aim for as we released the book into the world was let's just put in all this work so that Penguin are not disappointed that the penguin don't regret giving us the deal <laughs> you know just let's just make sure penguin don't regret this let's just you know try and you know get it you know as many eyeballs on it as possible and obviously anything beyond that felt like a bonus and and so it's gone way beyond i never gave myself the chance to even consider that it could be on the sunday times list at all and um so it was a massive shock but those things do you know those sorts of things um they they give you that kind of high to begin with and they feel great but you just move the goalpost right like it's um it, it they don't those sorts of feelings don't last like it's been great and I'm really grateful for it but for me the things that have really stuck with me is um and it hits me even talking about it you know thinking about some of the messages I've received from people um who are you know working through the book with their kids or their partner or um, they, they're doing it alongside therapy and they've made some incredible changes, you know, and they've turned their lives around or um, they thought they were coming towards the end of their life and then made a different decision. And, and those sorts of things really stick with me. And, um, 
because I don't think you can ever really, you know, measure the impact you've had. But being having the privilege of of people contacting me to say this has had a positive impact on my life means everything to me because that's that's the high that I get from from doing therapy. I'm just so I love doing therapy with someone. You get you get to have this unique relationship with someone. You get to know each other so well, and they tell you things they never told another soul, and and you you totally have their back and um and when they then make a a shift in a new direction or they achieve something and they're doing things for themselves and they're you know working towards a better life for themselves you feel absolutely euphoric for them and you just I mean I can't really do it justice by describing it in words but um so I guess the book doing that in you know smaller ways but on a bigger scale um it, it means everything to me that's that's the bit I love I think it, it comes down to something I've heard you speak about before, which is the difference between goals and values. And when you said you moved the goalpost there, the goal of creating the book, not letting Penguin down, was yeah. achieved. So yeah. the value of continuing to instill that one-to-one impact, that that family integration change that's come from the book. And there'll be thousands, tens of thousands of people that haven't messaged you that are having yeah. a remarkable impact on their lives as a result of the book that they've read. Because I, th- I say again, for anyone that's not read it, the practical application is the clearest and most direct way I've seen it done in, in this space. And I think that's something that's... Uh, you, you, the, the sleepless nights, I'd say, whilst they might have made it harder to write the book, they, they've very much paid dividends in terms of the finished product. So in terms of the, the values that you now hold in terms of moving forward, because obviously you've got a limited capacity to work with people in that clinical setting one-to-one, that's only going to get busier, I can imagine. Because I think the the opportunity you have to be the the biggest online presence in this space is is there, if not already claimed. So, where what are the short term goals that you now have, and what are the bigger picture thinking goals that you now have, and what is the 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 thread of DNA, the values that runs through them? Um, I, my my sort of main thread all the way along has been don't lose sight of the reason you started doing this. And I think when you start to move into this space and there's all these different opportunities, left, right and center to go in different directions. And and I I never wanted to sell out. I never wanted to um, steer away from the reason I did it. I never wanted it to be, you know, about me. It was about the sharing of this information. There's such useful information out there and, um, and it's hidden in research journals and therapy rooms and so, I always come back to whatever I do next and I'm not completely sure what that is yet because I'm still just nurturing the book I think um whatever that is I want it to be of real value and I want it to whatever I create I want it to be useful and um because essentially it is those human contacts you know the people that come back and say oh thanks for creating that that means everything to me so um you know whether I you know, I don't know whether I do things on a, a smaller scale, but I can impact people's lives, then that's fine. I, I don't honestly don't know how I'm going to sort of manage the clinical side of things because obviously suddenly it's it's blown out of proportion and and they're having this sort of very public life. Um, I don't, you know, before I was just running a little private practice in my back garden. <laughs> so I can't, I you know, I can't see people like that anymore. And I'm not sure how I'm going to manage it in terms of accepting referrals and where I get those from and stuff. So, and how I sort of look after my own privacy and because I've got kids and stuff. So um, that needs a bit of thought. And, and I'm really at that stage where now I need to start kind of thinking about what's, you know, what direction is next. And, but do you know what, the, the whole thing has one of the most incredible things is is it's enabled me to do things like connect with people like yourself and see these other really inspiring people who are doing this really brave stuff and they're doing extraordinary you know huge things that I couldn't imagine doing um all in the name of this this cause to help other people and I just feel constantly inspired by that and uh, I think I was saying to you earlier, like when I hit your Instagram page and I was just going through and, and it's interesting you said about, you know, lots of people won't write to you or they won't comment. And and I, I spent ages going through your stuff and I was showing it to my husband going, this is amazing. And I, I don't know that I left one comment, but it had an impact on me. Um, and I would absolutely, you know, recommend it to someone else to have a look at, to have that same sort of inspired feeling. So, um, yeah, I think, you know, making contact with people you know like yourself and other people who are doing these really meaningful 
um, purposeful challenges and and trying to kind of make change in people's lives. Um, I, I've, I've got to go in that direction. I don't know what that looks like behaviorally just yet, um, but I feel like it's moving in the right direction for me. I'd say a lot of uh, key metrics are indicating so, but on that <laughs> note, the the metrics, the views, the numbers, the overwhelm of the space in which you now operate, how do you process them? And have you been caught in the the balancing act between providing content that you think is going to do well versus providing content that you are intrinsically more driven by how, how have you balanced that relationship because it's something i have to constantly consider on a much smaller scale and mm. it can become frustrating it can become creatively bottlenecking in some ways and i'm very interested to hear for somebody that's yeah. got such a high turnover of content how you process that yeah and you know it's been a real journey for us as well it's been trial and error and um uh i'm i'm very lucky that um obviously you know my husband is the other half of my team and and he is much more into um when you use this title that worked really well or when you did this or you know when you used a prop or whatever that worked and so he can kind of look at things in that way and make suggestions whereas i think if i go down that route or start looking at numbers and stuff i find it more overwhelming because you you know because i'm on the camera and i'm you know out there that puts me in a vulnerable position so if I even start to think of it in terms of um people's opinions of it um then I think it halts it sort of stunts your creativity doesn't it and and I have to always keep in mind that idea of I want to be helpful and then it kind of battles up against my husband who's like yes but let's also be engaging and entertaining and try to draw people in with a good title and all that kind of thing so so together we then create that kind of really good balance um whereas you know um it, it must be really tough for people when when you're trying to put something out into the world but you quickly realize that you know these platforms reward you for doing certain things and not others and and it becomes a, a sort of balancing act between doing what you want to do and drawing in the audience and stuff um because you know like i mean even on on tiktok we made a video our our most I think it is still the most viral video we had um, on the Thatcher effect. And it's on these kind of, uh, it's about uh, how your brain recognizes faces. So it's another area of psychology. It's not really about mental health. It's just a fascinating um, demonstration about how your brain works. And um, it, I think it was on like 31 million views or something like that, which is, you know, wild and it brought in lots of followers, but it didn't necessarily bring in lots of followers that wanted mental health education. And then that's what they were getting from me. So, you know, you kind of, um, I think it is so important to stay, stay close to the stuff you want to be doing. And also because it's relentless, right? You, if you're going to be producing content constantly, it has to be on stuff that you, you want to do and is meaningful to you balanced with a bit of also I'm going to make it as entertaining as I can so that people feel engaged in it and um uh but yeah I, I don't think it's uh I think it's always a balancing act sometimes you but I find when I make a video that I am really proud of so let's say you know it's a message that I think is really important or has gone down well in therapy and we managed to make a video that we feel is good quality and we've said it in the right way and if I'm proud of that video I don't really care what views it gets because I know that if it hits less people, but those people find it really helpful, then I'm I'm more pleased with that than if I put out some kind of half-hearted thing that reaches more people because it's a bit more of a sort of viral idea. Um, so, I, you know, I've learned that through experience, um, which probably most people do have to. Um, uh, yeah, because I think it's only once you get a few followers behind you as well that you realise it's not the be all and end all as well. You know, you kind of, to reach a million followers on TikTok felt huge and it was this big celebration. And then suddenly we hit 2 million and it was like, oh yeah, okay. And so again, it's that moving the goalpost thing, right? You kind of, um, it's numbers. And while it is massively helpful to, to reach all those people, depending on what your mission is, um, you also, it, you focus on it to your detriment to some degree negativity bias isn't it we are we're yeah. only human and yeah. i think something i've i've become aware of recently is that i have stopped caring 
because I know that every YouTube video I put out, everything I put out on a week by week basis, is the absolute I best, the absolute yeah. best I could have done within the context of the time I had available and the creative capacity that I had while staying true to myself. So if yeah. it does well, great. If it doesn't, then I couldn't have done anything else anyway. So yeah. that realization for me has come out of necessity. But what that's done is freed me up psychologically to not worry about it. So I think yeah. having that that team between you and your husband to have one with a bit more of an analytical mind and then the other to just these are the messages I want to put across comes yeah. across very authentically and I think that's the buzzword that drew me to you so much in the first place is that authenticity behind it because it is just the practical advice that I'm sure you've given hundreds if not thousands of uh, clinical patients over time so speaking of hundreds of thousands if not clinical patients help me with something okay so I have recently we were speaking a little bit off off camera um about this off off air if we could say the, the negative self-talk in, I can't remember what chapter it is, chapter 18 or something I think it is, um, there was one practical application you gave there which is basically to almost view yourself from above. Um, or I can't remember exactly how it was worded. It was basically if you, if, you were, if you were placing somebody else within your context, how would you view what they were doing? And that really helped me look at things a bit more practically and look at them neutrally. But recently I've been struggling with spinning multiple plates, facing opportunity that is all positive and it is all worth saying yes to. So we can't say the strip things down to the essentialism, go full Greg McEwen on it and, and, and approach it that way. I'm struggling to distill down what are the things that I should be doing on a day-to-day -day basis, what are the things that are non-negotiable, truly non-negotiable, and then where do I fit things that are green zone, me time, relaxation. Because I don't have, I've got two dogs, which they're, they're part of my routine, but I don't have any children to devote that separate time to, that distinction. Are there any psychological tactics that or, or behavioral considerations that you would recommend for me to better frame what's important to me on a day-to-day -day basis because as somebody who's got a lot of self-awareness I am struggling to define clearly what my number one priority is what the what the secondary elements are and then how to actually process that all in my own head so I'm happy with the direction I'm going in rather than thinking okay try it this way try it that way because it's becoming quite overwhelming at points when another good opportunity comes along for example and it's often the good opportunities that are causing me to feel like I'm going backwards because I don't know how I'm going to take any more on but I don't want to say no to things so whilst that was a uh, a bit of a, a ramble I think that's probably one of the shorter ones that you've heard in your time no I mean it's interesting isn't it because I heard um uh I had a guy talking on an, on a podcast a while back. Uh, I can't remember his name now. Um, and he was saying about how like, you know, being an entrepreneur is like choosing anxiety as a lifestyle because there's this constant self-doubt and questioning about whether you're doing the right thing or spending your time doing the right thing or the wrong thing. And um, and, and I absolutely relate to that all the way. Look, because this has been a whole new world to me. And, and um, I relate to that idea of sort of constantly um whatever you're doing you sort of almost feel guilty that you're not doing the other thing and and you can't possibly fit it all in and, and how do you know that what you're doing is the right thing and I guess you don't I guess at no point do you know that that the thing you're doing is the best possible thing you could be doing and um so I in some ways part of it makes me think about the the literature on living with uncertainty and being okay with that uncertainty um but also uh, you know the those values check-ins that are in the um are in the book are really helpful and and I do those on a, a fairly sort of regular basis where um they're really simple and don't take very long but you can literally get on a piece of paper you know what what matters to me most right now and what the different areas of my life that matter to me not not what you want to happen to you but who you want to be the kind of person you want to be the way you want to be facing challenges and um, so you might split that into like, you know, um, intimate relationships, friendships, career, lifelong learning, creativity, health, whatever those things are. And then you kind of put those ideas in into the box about how you want to approach those areas of your life. And you can literally rate them. So you can say, OK, on a scale of once you've put those words in on a scale of one to ten, how important is it to me? Are these things to me? in my life and you might rate a certain area as 10 out of 10 and then you might use the same scale again and rate it in terms of how closely am I living in line with these values and let's say you you know rate an area as 10 out of 10 importance to you but 2 out of 10 in how much you're living in line with those values right now then that can be a really good indicator to redirect towards that area of your life again and um, put effort or time into that area so um I don't know, it might be that um, 
like for me along the way something that's probably a, been a big part of my balancing act along the way is um is this work taking me away from my children more than I want want it to or is it does it feel balanced and and often if I feel that the balance is a bit out of whack I will just redirect and move back towards um you know I took some time back and to spend you know another day with my my youngest and that kind of thing and so you can uh, not not dive into it with criticism but with curiosity about okay well well let's map it out what is important to me and why and um and am I kind of spending time on those things that are most important to me? But also, um, I think alongside that, there is just that degree of tolerating the uncertainty that, wow, I have all of these opportunities presented to me. I know I can't do them all. Am I going to carefully consider the ones that I choose based on my value system um, so that I can tolerate the uncertainty of not knowing if it will have the best outcome? You know, if the, if the meaning for the process is there, then um, then I will be a bit like the kind of producing the best video you want to produce um, that is meaningful to you and you think would help people. Um, it's much easier than to deal with however many views it gets because um, it wasn't about the outcome. It sounds like my takeaway. First of all, thank you. Actually, I didn't mean to intend. It didn't intend for this to turn into a personal therapy session because that seems a bit <laughs> cheeky, given that you've got a, a private clinic, and I'm just shoehorning this in there. But from a from a calibration point of view, I think it's just something that I think I've spoken to others in a similar position recently, especially entrepreneurial ones or, or those that are trying to balance family life alongside busy work and then try and do other things, whether it's training, whatever. It's just how do you do everything you want to do to the best of your ability at all times, I think is the, the essence of the question. And I think the takeaway for me there is I actually need to do a bit of a, a recalibration on the reality of my values rather than the short term, what's front of mind values that I am drawn to when I'm faced with a decision. I mm -hmm. almost need a, a reassessment of my North Star approach. And I, th I think what, one of the things you said there, it, it's, it's strange, I think, for me to consider this way, but I always have. And it's the fact that I am very aware that I would like to be the best father that I can be in the future, whenever that happens. And I would like to do as much now as I can to be able to have that freedom to be as present as possible. And not just present physically, but psychologically as well, where I'm, I'm in the room. And I think that means that I put pressure on myself to do a lot more in the short term which then causes me to lose sight of actually how much time I have to, to develop these things out. So I think reassessing those values and actually placing things into a much bigger, longer term context is something that would be very useful for me. Because I'll admit, I've seen use the value check-ins once or twice in the book, but I haven't made a habit mm -hmm. of it. So it sounds like it's something that having that, that column that's, what are they? And then how are you living in line with them? I think it's the second part, how are you living in line with them that I'm not assessing as often as I should be. So definite yeah. takeaway for me there. And hopefully there are for others as well, rather than just, uh, as yeah, I say again. And I think Stealing sometimes... therapy time. <laughs> yeah, well, I just, I, I, you know, there's no stopping me once I get started. But I mean, I think sometimes as well, it's that kind of um, just asking that that simple question to yourself, isn't it? What what choices would I make now that would mean in five years' time, and I was looking back on this chapter, that would make me feel proud of myself? How could I face this challenge now in a way that would make me proud of myself and my choices in five years' time? And and you, I think you've always got to hold in mind as well the idea that because I, I mean, I do this myself where I think, that, you know, the times when it's overwhelming and I want it all to go away and it's, um, you know, and I'm kind of and I'm not sure which way to go next and that kind of thing, and um, and I know that in five years' time and I'm looking back, I would be wishing that I had, um, I had not spent so much time worrying about whether I was getting it right or not. Um, and I know that I, you know, I would look back and go, I wish I'd stopped to enjoy it a bit and do the stuff that brought me joy and um, made me feel connected to people and the thing that gave me enough time to connect with my family at the end of the day. And, you know, you kind of, when you do that, so, you know, there's a bit in the book about sort of future self memories and stuff and you can kind of place yourself in the future, um, you know, looking back at this time and, and essentially it all, always comes back to those kind of things, doesn't it? Um, that you you the answers are there and you and you know what what you would look back on and feel um regretful about or proud about it's it, it's difficult to do at points even though it's something mm. i'm very aware of 
So I think we're all we're all our own worst enemies deep down, aren't we? But again, exactly. conversations like this one, and then conversations that between friends, between family members, between humans and dogs, as I so often do these days, <laughs> are very very valuable. So before we move on to the the real big question that I know you finished the book on, and the one that I think everybody's uh, hoping to leave today's conversation with the answer to on on how to live a meaningful life. What is the what are the lowest hanging fruits from an empathy point of view, from an impact point of view that people listening can take away to have an impact on those around them on a day to day basis? Granted that obviously they need to have their own self awareness, they need to be in a position where they're comfortable. What are the things that we can do to have an impact, which will then hopefully have that that trickle down effect to really really tackle this crisis head on in the UK and beyond? In terms of sort of supporting people who are struggling with their mental health. Yeah. Um, yeah. I think there's a few things here. I think um, there is, I, I would say, I mean, I've made a video on this recently. Try not to get into that trap of becoming the rescuer. Um, there is that tendency, the most natural human response when someone you love is struggling is to try and scoop them up and fix whatever it is that's causing them pain and make it all go away. And and often, while that makes us feel good because it eases our discomfort that we can't fix this, um, it can be almost disempowering for the person who's going through their own process and their own journey. And um, that doesn't mean don't support them, but support is best when it um, enables kind of a recovery. So let's say, um, I don't know, let's say someone's really struggling um, and it part of their therapy is to make sure they get out for a walk every day. Um, but they're still managing to cook, right? They're still managing to make themselves meals every day. If, you, if someone then goes into that environment and says, don't worry about the cooking, I'll cook for you, I'll bring your meals around. Da, da, da. You've taken that thing from them that feels like you're doing a nice thing, but essentially that was something they were managing. And then once that's taken away from them, they then have to think about putting that back in place. It becomes another rung of the ladder to work on. Whereas if you come around and say, oh, that, that walk you need to do every day, I'll meet you, I'll meet you at the end of the road and we'll go together. You know, you're kind of, you're helping them to, to make the things happen that need to happen for them to recover. So often it's um, a great way to kind of support people is, is helping them practically do, do the things they need to do for their recovery. Um, rather than kind of scooping up and trying to make it all go away. Um, but also don't put yourself on this pedestal of needing to be the therapist, right? Um, it's it's a profession in itself and um, you don't have to know exactly what to say and how to say it to get it right and to be a good support for someone. And gosh, when I've worked with people who are in the depths of despair and maybe they're I don't know let's say they're, someone is grieving and they're in pain all the time but they have this friend that pops around every couple of days and they go out for a walk together and while they're walking or they go out for coffee together and during that time they don't really talk about the thing but they talk about everything else and they have a laugh and a joke and this tv program they've been watching and, and it becomes I know I've had people who have said oh it's just sometimes it's the best part of my week because it gives me this window where I just forget for a minute and it gives me this moment of replenishment and a bit of rest from the pain and it's okay to be that friend you don't if you don't feel able to talk openly and ask the questions because you're afraid that you can't contain any emotion that might come up it's okay if you don't feel skilled to do that you can support in other ways and um so because I think tendency for a lot of people is to withdraw because they think I don't want to say the wrong thing I don't want to make it worse and I have no idea how to help um it's okay to help in in your own way and it's okay to ask someone as well like if you know gosh someone sometimes the best thing to say is I really care about you and it matters to me that you recover and you get better um but I have no idea how to support you what would be the best way I could help you right now what would be the best things I could do and tell me when I get it wrong and I won't take it personally because this matters to me and I you know I want to support you so it's okay to ask those questions and kind of you know it's the elephant in the room thing just say it name it if you feel like you're worried about saying the wrong thing say that um, because people will get it to use your previous analogy it, it's it's again it's just reinforcing get get in the pit with them rather yeah. than 
to, yes. to, to extend the metaphor you've just given for, for no real reason but I've committed here yeah. I? It's, it's, it, ra- ra- rather than rather than yeah. chucking them a rope down and then just sort of yeah. helping them out it's, it's getting in there and helping them understand because that might give them the strength to get out with you or it might yeah. just distract them from the, the reality of the situation empathy is the real buzzword and I think that's 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 what I found to be most effective because even if it doesn't work straight away especially bloke to bloke I've got a lot of experience speaking to to blokes that are still resilient to this sort of thing, even if yeah. you just show that you understand whether they vocalize that to you or not, that will help them better process the situation they're in because it'll make them think, okay, there's somebody there that gets it. Yeah. Maybe this allows me to think about it. And if I can't understand that anymore, I can talk about it with them again. It gives them that, it gives them that channel. And I think one of the one of the biggest things and one of the biggest reasons that I've fallen in love with training the way that I do so much is because, like you just said there, it gives me moments where I get to forget and reflect on things that I don't get the chance to reflect on in my day to day life. Sadly, and I've become become aware of this recently, training is now part of my job, which is a great thing. I don't want to sound in any way ungrateful for that because I've worked to put myself in that position and it's not been accidental, but it means that I now need to find opportunities to to regain that that peace, that reflection, that that value that I got from training before it was all metrics it was all this mm. it was needing to be done at this time otherwise you wouldn't be able to get that job done so for me it's i i, I need to i need to find find an opportunity to go, go on that walk with that person and and have that opportunity to reflect so whatever that ends up being isn't your problem but i will uh, yeah. i'll figure it out but just to put it in, into my own context that's and, where and we are helped? so the golden I mean, when, qu- sorry i'm 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 coming no, in my go, own <laughs> this is i'm so used to asking being the person asking the questions but i i guess i'm curious about um what helped you? So, you know, of the people that that may have supported you on your journey, was there anything that stood out as being really helpful? Treating me, treating me as if I was the the same person that I thought I was before I was suffering, I think is the way to go. I I, I never wanted sympathy, so underhanded empathy is sort of the way I'd summarize it. Is I wanted people to, I wanted people to help by not helping in a way and that was just by spending time with them and and ultimately it was seven months after my suicide attempt where I actually told anyone the reality of the situation I'd been in other than the 14 week old French bulldog that I had at the time and he couldn't talk back and again from a bloke point of view from a masculine point of view I think part of the safety of me being open for the first time outwardly was that I knew that the pig dog couldn't talk back which meant that there was no judgment to come so that allowed me to then I'd say receive the support I needed, which was actually just being treated like the person that I thought that I was again, rather than this social, anxious, nervous, self-doubting recluse that I'd almost become as a result of spending 18 months getting worse and worse with my with my depression. The worst thing that anybody could have done upon reflection, and even now, is is almost try and hold my hand where it doesn't need held. It's it's very much again it's it's sort of getting in the pit with somebody and that's what I try and do with those around me is is first of all understand the situation that they're in obviously I can't understand it because there's a state of irrational being that can come from being in that state because I, I reflect on the decisions I made and the thoughts that I had when I was depressed and I, I have no comprehension of how I thought that way or could see things that way but it was because I was depressed that's that's a simple answer we don't really need much more of an understanding beyond that so for me it's um. It's understand. It's being comfortable in my own thoughts, which has been a learnt skill. And then when I'm vocalising those thoughts with others, it, it's it's an open and honest conversation both ways. And I think that doesn't need to be too psychologically analysing. It can just be an honest how are things with a little bit more nuance and a little bit more detail than the standard British stuff. So I think there's still, whilst I I view myself as pretty devoid of ego, there is still an element of that typical masculinity within me that doesn't want doesn't want to be treated in a way that I don't see aligns with who I believe I am as a person, if that makes sense. So anyone supporting me, I feel almost needs to, I don't want to say get to my level, but be on the same sort of plane of, of understanding. And that is looking at things practically, looking at things objectively and trying to find a way out together rather than oh, as you've said, great example is, is just piling on sympathy because that's just going to make me feel more, away from the person that I want to be and that might be a self-critical thing but I think it's um I I get the most from support from others helping navigate through the challenge in front rather than having somebody else navigate the challenge for me I think is me rounding up my thoughts after a long uh, air that's so true and 
And there's something about, you know, people talk a lot about the sort of, um, you know, the, the, the gender differences there and them. And, and we don't want to, I think it's a mistake to try and um, uh, change or shift the sort of the masculinity side of it, that we have to work with that and um, and use that to, to but, but direct it towards recovery, right? Masculinity is pretty amazing at taking action and making things happen so if we can direct that that energy and that strength towards something healthy like recovery um with the right approaches like you were saying then then we're heading in the right direction i think i agree and i think i think one thing i just want to flag there is is because i see it oh so often in the echo chamber that i'm in on social and the people i spend my time with is the gym is my therapy or this is my therapy or five aside is my therapy and that's something i try and refute because it isn't it is a form of distraction that allows you to momentarily forget the thing that probably requires the therapy and as you've said therapy is a profession it is a thing that people require and it's something that you can equip yourself with through understanding and going through the process and you can come to it through different journey you can come to the same th realization through different journeys but but the gym these these pursuits that we all have in our day-to-day -day lives that give us that escape aren't solving the problems they're just giving us an opportunity to reflect on them in a different way which is where i think that masculinity oh i've solved the problem let's move on when it comes to that sort of thing can be quite damaging because it means that you think that you're no longer susceptible to the ebbs and flows of life the ebbs and flows of our mental health the ebbs and flows of having a negative circadian rhythm or 10 pints on a saturday and then you've got a stressful monday which means that the rest of the week might be chaos all these little things that can knock us being ignorant to the fact that we're not susceptible to them, I think is something that only comes from understanding that we're all susceptible to it. And whilst we've all got our own things that help distract us from them, the problem is not solved. All we can do is be equipped with the tools as you have yeah. so aptly run through in your book and use those tools as and when required. And that's where things like, um, you know, martial arts and stuff like that are so, uh, have so much kind of wisdom around them that, that um, you don't, you don't win in a martial arts by ignoring vulnerabilities you win by knowing exactly what they are and working with them um and i think it's the same in mental health and physical health and the thing with martial arts is all the respect that goes around it hmm. they can probably kick your head in and they're <laughs> the ones that are most honest with themselves so it yes. again goes back to that 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 resilience from a that resilience from a viewing talking about mental health as a weakness side of things again yeah. it, it really just makes that argument implode somewhat but mm. we've uh, we've reflected on some of the elements of what it means for myself to live and lead a meaningful life but there is a whole the final chapter of the book that the conclusion of the drawn out conclusion of the book is the big question how do we live a meaningful life and if you were to summarize that chapter and the things that people can take away from it to live a meaningful life in their own lives what mm. would that look like um, I think start with that idea that I, where I talked about the things like the values check-ins is um, take the time to ask yourself those questions about, you know, no one gives you the meaning. You decide what that meaning is going to be and what matters to you and what what gives you such a sense of purpose. You know, when, when you find something in your life that that you see as so important and that matters so much that it's worth being uncomfortable for then that gives you that kind of thread of this purpose to sort of follow through life and and i think people are maybe there's a sort of misconception around you know social media and stuff that that you need to have this epiphany moment and you just you know you discover that that this one thing is really important to you it doesn't always happen like that like i didn't I didn't have some epiphany moment that where I found out that this was my life's path. I followed my interests to begin with and I, I just found humans fascinating. And so I loved studying psychology and reading it for pleasure and that kind of thing. So um, it doesn't mean you have to know from a young age what your life's purpose is going to be. It means that you're, you're always curious as to at this point in your life what seems to matter most at the moment and what does that mean in terms of how you want to live your life and the kind of person you want to be and how you want to face face the different challenges um and then keep reassessing keep going back to that because that that value system will change over time and um uh i think when i did the the stephen bartlett con uh the stephen bartlett podcast um 
there was a question around you know how can we know what that meaning is like really early in life so that we go on the right path and it just doesn't work like that you know you're never going to have the same set of values when you're 17 as when you're 45 you know the kind of um as as you go through life and your circumstances change your values will change your you know as you develop and mature your values change as well and that's okay you just got to stay in touch with them and reevaluate them so i would say keep doing those little values check-ins that i talked about and um and asking yourself what matters but then turn it into concrete behavioral action so that you are living in line with it and not just thinking about it and what does a meaningful life mean to you at this point in your life um for me it's this um balancing act at the moment between um because i mean to be be fair my my life sort of value system completely flipped upside down once I had children and it was just, you know, it's all about them. And, um, from someone who was just focused on my career to begin with it, it, yeah, it flipped inside out for sure. And so then when this stuff happened, um, which felt like a once in a lifetime opportunity, um, it created lots of conflict for me around, but I also really want to be present for my children and stuff. So now it, it becomes meaningful life becomes, how can I impact as many people as I can around the world in a positive way with this skill set that I have um, while also doing the most important job to me which is bringing up my children in a way that's going to equip them in life um, so that they can go on and have meaningful lives themselves Um, so yeah it's it's a constant sort of tightrope you never quite have it perfect but I'm constantly aware and monitoring that so that I can sort of change direction if I need to and do you view that definition you've just given as any different from your definition of success oh good question um oh I don't know I don't know um what do I see as success um yeah for me success is um yeah finding a way to live in line with that while also finding a way to enjoy the ride at times um uh yeah that's really yeah i guess if i if i can raise three children into the world um fully equipped um then i yeah i would consider that a success um yeah sounds like a slightly more metric focused version of your definition of how you want to live a meaningful life which i'd say is exactly how i view things my definition of my definition of success is how much time can i spend doing the things i enjoy doing with the people mm-hmm. i enjoy doing them and if i was then to attack attach metrics to that i keep it purposefully gray area because it means i can't be critical on myself if uh, yeah. everything's too black and white because i know how that that story yeah. almost ended but it's I, I try and keep them very close close by my my definition mm. of my definition of what a meaningful life looks like to me is very tied up in my definition of success so I was just curious to hear what you have to say but yeah I was just thinking about how like success could be if you see it as a goal you know that thing you can achieve and then ah oh, I'm a success now or you know I've been successful now and that's the end then it's almost limiting isn't it a bit like the goals versus values thing that are things you know successful at the moment in terms of are you looking after yourself and your family and you have connections and life feels meaningful yes things are successful at the moment and they're moving along that it feels successful rather than i get there and then it's done it's like sometimes it will feel like i'm being successful and sometimes it will feel like i'm not but um if i'm always aiming for a certain thing and i'm aware of what i'm aiming for then it's probably on that path and that's one of the big lessons for me today is why it's so important for me to constantly, practically, on paper, reevaluate those those value check-ins and just constantly recalibrate on my my North Star in terms of how I'm living my life because that will keep me on the, on the closest degree of accuracy in terms of navigating everything that's in the way of getting there. And mm. also be aware of the fact that that path is constantly changing because being ignorant to that was what ultimately almost led me to being another suicide statistic because I had such a black and white view on how I was going to get to my definition of success, which was completely tied up in cars, finance, job prestige, white collar jobs, this, all the obvious stuff. And that gave my life almost nothing to the point where I didn't consider it worth living. So I purposely have a very gray definition of it now because it gives me the freedom to be fluid, malleable and open-minded to what's best for me and those around me. And that's a that's a sense of freedom in and of itself i think 
So true and so refreshing for people to hear as well when a lot of what we're fed is that you have to be this, that and the other in order to be considered enough and um, it's not true and, and it's um, not helpful to anyone's health. It's um, really detrimental and um, so yeah, it's great that people like yourself are out there kind of shouting that out to people because it needs to happen. Well, I'll, I'll take that as a compliment. Thank you very much. But it's it's pale in comparison to the to the reach that you're getting in terms of the real practical advice. It's it's again, I, I think it's a, it's something that nobody is doing nearly as well as you. So with that in mind, it's hard to miss. But where can people find you, and where is your preferred output for them to get the book from? Um, yeah. So I guess if you find me on sort of um, Instagram, uh, I'm just Dr. Julie on there, and all the links are in the bio if you want to get get the book um then that's probably the the simplest place to go on and just click through um or but it's in um most bookshops and stuff um uh, across the uk now and um it's starting to be published in different countries and different languages and stuff so um it's it's around um but yeah if not instagram then then youtube as well on audible as well isn't it and is it just in english at the moment on on Audible, yeah, um, and I recorded it. So I often say to people, you know, if you can't bother to read it and you want me to read it for you, I've done it. So you know, uh, you can get it on Audible, and that's an easier easier. That's how I read most books these days, right? You can put your your headphones on and crack on with something that you there's you know some boring job that you need to do and read a book at the same time. It's great. I treat I treat it as a test run. I I tend to listen to something on Audible, and if I enjoy it, I then go back and read it. So it's because uh, then I can get more from it and and go through it with a highlighter. But it does mean yeah. that well. I sadly don't make enough time to be able to do that as efficiently as I'd like to. But from what I can see from behind you, I don't have nearly as books to get through as you do. So, <laughs> <laughs> and and probably not one of these is read cover to cover. You know, it's a it, I, that's you know why it was written the way it was written. That's a, a dip in, dip out, go in, get the information you need, and then and then go and use it. So, um, yeah. And for those listening, I can't recommend it enough. It was a, I knew it was going to be good because it, it 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 promised to be a practical application, but it was very very digestible for anyone and everyone, which is hard to do. So, congratulations again, and thank you very much for today's thank you so conversation. Much.